I was a kid growing up, my mom used to say that if the house ever caught fire, the one thing that she would grab before anything else was the box of family photos that she kept in her closet, which I'm sure was common for many of us before analog became digital. For my mom, those photos were the things, the objects, that she held most dear. More than a favorite piece of clothing or jewelry or even money. They anchored her to specific memories and feelings and because of that were more or less irreplaceable. Objects have meaning and more importantly they have value. And to what degree we value the objects in our lives is different for all of us. Why objects matter is what we're talking about in this episode. I'm Jeffrey Sidoris. I'm talking to John Wilkening, and this is In Between. Speaking of powerless. Powerless, right. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> right, 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 right. So are, are you back to dry, or are you still somewhat underwater? Yeah, yeah. Um the we're not in a traditional sort of flood plane mm -hmm. we're in flood plane created by government decisions let's put it that way so basically the look we i live behind the block of houses is the regional train and a stream runs into the road in front of our house then under the block of houses and out by the train tracks mm-hmm in their infinite wisdom, they decided to try to stop flooding the train tracks, so they put a culvert restricting water flow out of the pipe. So now, the neighborhood floods. Uh, train tracks are dry, but everybody that lives around it <laughs> gets yeah, screwed. Not, you know, I, d I didn't know people were living in the train tracks, but I was mistaken. Right. And, and so the neighborhood's been yelling at this the town forever to fix this problem and they went in and spent all this money and redid the whole drainage on our street no flooding for eight years so you know up to that point we've been always careful about putting stuff in our basement because of like the last major one was in 2011, I believe. Mm -hmm. Is is that the? I think we talked about that. Is that the one that was like four feet of water? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. They're, they're, like you had things floating. Like the car was even kind of you know underwater. Oh, yeah. We lost we lost both of our cars. You know, it was one of those where we woke up and my car's bobbing in the front front of the street. Wow. Um, so, in this doesn't happen for eight years, and then on the top of the hill in our town was this big uh, wooded area that was an old, uh, not monastery, but the nuns ran it. There was a church. There was a school for delinquent kids that had closed down, but it was like this old... Was it a reform school? Did you live at a reform school, John? <laughs> <laughs> were, were, you one of the, were you one of the troublemakers? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I was that, but not. <laughs> they didn't catch on till much later. Um, so they, that went through, long story short, that's being turned into a development because that's how life goes. Right. And leave no tree unturned. <laughs> yeah. So this storm, uh, basically a remnant of a hurricane came through on Tuesday and our street flooded for the first time in eight years. Wow. And. We had about three feet of water outside our house. So basically what happens is the stream, it has too, pushing too much water into it that so it starts building up. And as soon as it overflows the street level, basically the water runs down the hill through our yards, down the hill to where those train tracks are. And you basically get a three foot river just flowing through. And then what happens is the water hits the level of, goes above the level of our walkout basement and just starts coming down the basement steps. Hmm. So what so, was it about this storm though? Was it because of the development that that's now going in? Why, why now versus the past eight years? 
So obviously I'm not a environmental engineer, but because they're that now once hill used to be absorb a lot more water because now it's houses, park, you know, roads, just a dirt hill. There's no, there's, there's some landscape, but it's not, there's no vegetation on it. Mm -hmm. So now it's, now more water is running off the hill, down the, so to speak, down the hill and into, into that stream. So it's now pushing the capacity of that stream more than it has the previous eight years. That's our theory. Wow. But, you know, that, that will be argued in neighborhood meetings now, probably for the next foreseeable future. And do you so, have any recourse with the city or township or county or anything? Or is it just, sorry, you're on your own? It's more of a sorry on your own. Wow. Because from a engineering standpoint, they put in, you know, pro- appropriate runoff, pro- you know, like. Right. You know, but it's. A- according to the standards manual, <laughs> all yeah, conditions yeah. have been met. <laughs> Exactly. You know, right, and unfortunately right. it's one of those where they're looking at it from just a site specific and not an impact into the entire top of your graphical chain. Right. So we probably at the deepest, the water is about two feet in my basement. Wow. Um, and our chest freezer was one corner was bobbing up like floating. Wow. Fun fact that still worked. <laughs> don't know how but you take the winds where you could get them right 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 <laughs> uh, but because of all this what happens is as soon as the water slows down enough like it there's probably about in about two hours my basement is doesn't have standing water mm-hmm. like it drops that fast wow but you just then obviously have like a all this mud that just flew went into the basement plus right. all the water damage. So the whole the whole the reason I'm bringing this up. Well, yeah, it, it, this is it, this is so <laughs> this is going somewhere. It, yeah, no, and it, and it's we talked about this the other day. This is so this re- reaction or response is is so you, and it's one of the reasons I love you. So yeah, it, it, so please continue. So. so <laughs> Up to for a while in our basement, we're like, we're not putting anything in the basement that it's not gonna that you don't want to lose because of flooding, right? So, we're very careful. But and you're evaluating after, object by object at this point, aren't you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, anything of value is obviously we'll find a spot somewhere in the upstairs house for it, but after eight years of nothing and then. You know, we... You let your guard down, John. Yep. You know, and, you know, <laughs> you put hardwood floors throughout the house. Right. So you had to move all this stuff to the basement. And now life, you're not going to put all this crap that you put in the basement back upstairs because you didn't actually use it. Like, yada, yada, yada. It's it's fine down there. I'll clean it up at some point in the future. Right. You know, and then all of a sudden it floods. And so there's items that have been in my basement for eight years would be minimum. You know, we've lived in the house 10 years. Mm -hmm. And there's stuff that we I've moved into the house, threw it in the basement and and sort of forgot. So I don't like if you if two weeks ago you said do you have emotional attachment to that box of stuff? Absolutely not. I don't even know what's in it. It was like a weird messed up Christmas opening these boxes where I was like, what is ruined today? Right. right. You know, like, <laughs> what, have, what have we lost? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But the weird feeling and what I want to talk to you about, because I should, I felt some sort of weird loss for this stuff that I didn't know I missed and would I'll probably argue with anyone who said I valued that stuff as saying, obviously not because it's been in the basement for this long. Right. Just empirically, that can't be the case because of my actions. 
yeah, I don't have these things around me on a day to day basis. So how much can they possibly mean to me? There, there's some exactly. of that. Ex exactly. But we ended up, you know, obviously there's number, you know, this does, doesn't fully paint the picture, but we threw out roughly 30 bag, you know, those black construction bags mm -hmm. with the stuff. You know, it it worked out to that volume of stuff. Wow. And. And were there any surprises in terms of what ended up getting tossed or I guess what I'm getting at, were there specific items that upset you or was it just the volume of physicality that you had to remove that upset you or a combination of both? The. I don't know. I think it was the volume. And I almost get into the point where I think it was the the forced loss. You didn't have and a choice in it. I didn't have a choice. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Where, where if you were to give me, hey, do you want to throw this out? Absolutely. Get rid of it. Don't think of it again. But to be, to have the die cast for you. Right. You were removed from the decision making. Correct. Yeah. Correct. And I know, and and so like, when this last week, I just kept on sort of trying to figure out like the value of things in that relationship, where you you don't even know how to put this you don't know its value or even its meaning to you until it's taken away from you. But then even then it's not even a real value. It's just almost a, because I have to get rid of it value. Mm -hmm. Like I, it's, it's, it's one of those questions that I wanted to sort of throw this scenario to you and sort of, what are your thoughts around this? Because I don't have an answer. Well, it seems like on some level, it's a it's the removal of power, right? It's the removal of decision making. The die was cast, as you said, and and you didn't have any sort of choice or or even response other than this object has now been destroyed, and it has to go. Mm -hmm. And whether or not the object itself or objects themselves had a lot of meaning individually or collectively. I think part of it is you didn't get to decide. Yeah. And, and it, it, it there's something in the deciding. I mean, when I moved here, in fact, this is, this is kind of interesting because on the, I think it was the 10th. So we're recording this on what is today? The 12th? 13th? 13th? 13th. Okay. So the 10th was the five year anniversary of me moving to the East coast. Um, actually we got here on the ninth, uh, but the 10th was like the first day I woke up on the East coast and five days prior to that, you know, I left California with everything that would fit in my car, a Honda fit and everything that didn't fit got left behind. So Yes, I was able to make choices, but I, on some level, I, I wasn't able to make choice based on what I wanted to keep. I had to make choices based on what would fit and what wouldn't fit. Mm -hmm. So on some level, it's, it's not quite the same, but there's a similarity in that some of those choices were made for me simply because of size or volume. Yeah. And there, there is this weird thing that you go through where because it was your stuff, whatever that stuff is, and, and now that stuff is gone, that somehow a piece of who you are is gone because on some level we are at least partially defined by the stuff that we have. Yeah. Yeah. I I would I wouldn't say we're defined by the stuff we have, 
but it's an expression of mm-hmm. who we are. Yeah, maybe defined is the wrong word now that I think about that. It paints a picture. Yeah. And so it, so it becomes one of those where you're, in essence, throwing away the visual expression of your own tastes and preference. Mm-hmm. Um, they're the the visual manifestations of those. Right. So, and and while it is strange to think that somehow a red refrigerator was a reflection of who I am, <laughs> God damn, I miss that refrigerator. <laughs> you know? <laughs> Nobody has a red refrigerator, and I had one, right? And and having to leave that behind, I've been bummed about it on you know, more or less over the years for the past five years. You know you can paint a refrigerator. Yeah, I know, but it's not the same. <laughs> <laughs> so were were there specific items or objects as you're going through all of this stuff, putting it in bags, were there specific objects that upset you more than others? Or was it just like, okay, we're on bag number eight and we still have, you know, 22 bags to go was it the volume that just sort of piled yeah. on the 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 feelings of 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 sort of sadness or loss I think it I think it was just the volume I mean I there's definitely some some you know I I lost a a nice a nice good chunk of my cookbook collection mm. um you know that was a casualty of, you know, moving it down to the basement to redo our hardwood floors. And right. then I hadn't brought them back up. And there were, there were a number of tools. Should we kickstart yeah. your, your cookbook collection and get you, <laughs> no. get you some titles back? <laughs> <laughs> no, <laughs> my, uh, my wife's, my wife's bless her heart. Just like, you really need that many cookbooks. <laughs> like, yes. Yes. I was like, I'm like, who cooks in this house? And she's like, fair point. Yeah. No. Okay. Now (laughs) speaking of your wife, Mm -hmm. what was her reaction relative to yours? Were you guys on the same page? Was she more affected, less affected? Um, probably more affected. Mm -hmm. Uh, Some of that for her is the, she she deals with sort of the, if you want to say the mental health issues mm-hmm. as many of us do but um i'm better equipped for this because of how i grew up and i'll get into that in a second mm-hmm. but, kind of um, the transience of of yeah, how you grew yeah, up yeah cause, sure cuz like my you know for those who don't know i grew up overseas my parents were missionaries and when i was roughly about nine we moved from amsterdam to india and i remember my mom being like look we can't we're taking your lego collection and two stuffed animals and that's and we're selling every other toy you own Mm. and every other stuffed animal let's come back to that because there there is a similarity between that event and this event in terms of the, the absence of choice. Oh, uh, fun. To, yeah, absolutely agree. Um, but so, so Anna didn't, my wife didn't uh, like, there was more of a, she, she's more affected by the uncertainties of life and the fact that yes, there was a big cleanup, And, you know, the biggest thing in dealing with flooding is trying to clean it up fast enough and, and sort of bleach everything to prevent mold Mm -hmm. because, you know, that, that could be even bigger problem than the flooding itself. So, um, but it was, it was almost the return of uncertainty Mm -hmm. because now, now anytime there's a monster thunderstorm. The question is, do we have to move our cars? Right. Is this going to mess up our lives? For right. That that safety and security that you'd experienced for the past eight years has, on some level, been obliterated again. Correct. Yeah. Correct. Just, you know, so much of 
home is the feeling of protection. Mm-hmm. You know, it is, it is the physical, it's a physical structure we've built and created to protect us from the outside elements. Right. And now those outside elements can come in right. through the walkout. So her, her sort of anxiety over the whole thing, it sounds like anyway, and correct me if I'm wrong, but it sounds like it's even got less to do with the stuff that was lost and, and more to do with the, the, the parameters that let that happen. Yeah. Yeah. That would, and uh, that's a good way of putting it. You know, it's, it is the reintroduction of chaos. Right. Right. You know, another element of chaos. How much of that spills over onto you? Because uh, on some level, there's not really a whole lot you as an individual can do about it. You as a yeah. husband can do about it as a well, father, you know, all, all of those things. So how does, how does that affect you? It, you know, it's one of those where my role comes ex- almost explicitly being able to handle that adversity and mm-hmm. that chaos mm-hmm. and, and personality wise, that's, I'm good at that. You know, I'm who you, who you hear and who you see is pretty much what you get. Yeah. 99% of the time. Yeah. You know, John is I, one of the most stable, even tempered, even keeled people I've ever met in my life. And I, appreciate that so much <laughs> as you know yeah so so you know if you need somebody to talk you off the ledge john is the guy to call yeah yeah oh just watch out i have a sense of humor so unfortunately sometimes <laughs> i will go for jokes that are not not appropriate yeah yeah time. phrasing and so. timing might be suspect but but the uh the, the empathy is there my heart's in a good place. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Um, so so it, that that's the role in sort of our dynamic. Mm-hmm. And it just gets magnified in these types of scenarios. Um And is how does Miles react? Is he even aware yet of these kinds of things? Or is is it still kind of an adventure? Like how how does he react in these kinds of situations? So, so this was his first flood. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, he, he, he didn't experience the ones prior to this. Right. Right. Um, and he, he definitely viewed it more of a, uh, a venture Mm -hmm. because, you know, you know, what turn what ends up happening is everyone on the street sort of notifies everyone else on the street on what's happening and we've all been through these mm-hmm. and so it becomes one of those things where we're standing on our porch just basically watching the car accident right like knowing you can't stop it mm-hmm. and it's just gonna hit you but miles is running around he's like the water is now on the first step <laughs> and then <laughs> he's you know, right he's like giving running. you the play-by-play as you're going yeah oh shit yeah, what's yeah. next yeah, he wants to he wants to play in the play in the street, right? You know, with, and I'm like, I'm like, you're seven, bud. There's your water's up to your chest. You can't go in the water. And he's like, but it's a river, right? Right. <laughs> like, you know, so it it's really interesting when you if you just examine it from like this is how a child views it. Mm-hmm. You know, this is a this is a new adventure a new thing and you know are you able to be kind of present for that and sort of allow some of that vicariously to 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 get into you or are you in sort of safety and lockdown mode from the jump you know that that comes down to personality as well you know i'm more of a like this we're strapped into this train ride it's going to it's going to end wherever it ends mm-hmm. like there's obviously we're going to take you know do best as we can to minimize the damage that it causes. But like at the end of the day, water is going to do what water is going to do. Right. Like, right. You know, 
you know, you sort of have to, you almost have to like take a deep breath and just let it hit you and then, you know, see where you bounce off of, you know, like the, you know, the, it's like the, well, this is the, or it was like, this is a roller coaster. You're strapped in. Right. You're, you're, you're going up that tr- up the hill and there's like you're like this is the ride yeah this is what you signed up for yeah you know i you i you can't get off like this is not nothing could happen so did you value because i I wrote down a note when we talked last time and it it was just why physical objects matter Mm -hmm. did your relationship to objects the the value or the importance in your life was it different before that first big move or can you remember that far back uh it's hard to remember that far back Mm -hmm. um i'm just wondering how much the transience of of your life has informed or even dictated how attached you get to objects of any kind. Yeah, no, uh, it's something I've actually considered, you know, before Mm -hmm. where I think I have a combination of a very detached view of objects because I like, I almost, I almost recognize that they they can be thrown away and replaced. But at the same time, I also have value objects in, in obtaining objects in almost a celebratory fashion. Give me an because example. Like, um, now you're going to put me on the spot. <laughs> Come on. You know that. You know how this works. Yeah, yeah I know. It's just one of those things where you're like, oh, that sounded good. Ah, oh, man, I have to back this up. <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't, I don't know how, I, like, in terms of just, so I, I don't know if this actually proves my point, but I'm one of those people that if I see something, that I want and I'll just pick it up it and obviously I'm taking account budget. It's not, I'm not just going out and buying Leicas and all that sort of stuff. But like I have, I have a, a weird habit of collecting things. You know, my office right now has, probably like 10 different house plants and you know a couple orchids like all sorts of stuff you know and that's just a little thing because working at trader joe's they'll bring in some house, new house plants I'm right like, oh i don't have that one right I'll just pick it up and, well, and that collector that. mentality i mean i've i've known you for a little while now and that collector mentality it, it's it's constant but it shifts from object type to object type is that fair? Oh, yeah. Yeah. hundred no, percent. Yeah. You know, like the cookbooks. Like mm-hmm. I had my pre-flood numbers. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, uh, I, I had probably 50 cookbooks. Wow. And my, it drove my mom nuts because that was like, I'm, I'm traditionally hard to, buy gifts for right and cookbooks were always on have always been on the list and and but my mom's like why do you always ask for cookbooks for christmas and i'm like because anna yells at me if i buy too many of them so it's easier <laughs> to just get well, see now she can start over now yeah. now you're good for years <laughs> now <laughs> exactly but it that that collector mentality is like I think you're very, very astute by saying that it runs through everything. Because then, you know, if you want to look at it, that that piece or that attitude applies to more than just objects, mm-hmm. and that 
that's how I approach information and skills as well. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, where, you know, if, you know, I've listened to podcasts where it's two theoretical physicists talking and right. if I understood 20% of the conversation, that would be a huge success. But I find it fascinating because here are two people who are top of their respective fields, even though I have nothing to do with that field. And I gain a little piece of something extra. Yeah. Yeah. There's still some sort of osmosis that happens. Yeah. Yeah. And the, the beauty of it is if I start talking to somebody who's into something different, I I'm, sort of like you and I'm hundred percent on board. It's mm-hmm. like, Oh, let's, why, why are you interested in this thing? Explain it. Like not, not from like, uh, like justify your interest in that. No, no, no. It's not a like judgy it, thing. It, no, but it's the very much, uh, like, obviously you, you think this is cool. Mm-hmm. Share that feeling of it being cool with me. Right. You no, know, share right, that, right, right. that, that, what what drives you and that's kind of the juice of it right i mean you've turned me on to podcasts artwork design work music that i don't quite understand and i may not even i may not even like at first or at all (laughs) (laughs) but the process of experiencing it something comes out of that whether you whether you understand it completely, enjoy it fully, or pursue it beyond those initial experiences, again, there is some sort of um, osmosis that takes place that that moves you in a different direction. And that, as we have talked about probably thousands of times at this point, that's part of the point, is to move the needle in some sort of direction. Mhm. Mhm. Yeah, and I think I've I've talked to this multiple times, but like people people have this weird um sort of ethereal view of creativity where which I think is almost a mystical view of it and I guess that's a better word for it. And I I almost disagree with that notion and that I think creativity is simply connecting two dots that no one sees as being connectable and what i do is just keep on collecting dots in a hope that one day i could connect some of them and you know a lot of the a lot of the i almost approach that's you know stuff the very similar way in that i collect the stuff because one day it might matter or it might be useful or hopefully useful far sooner than that, but right. you get what I'm saying. <laughs> you know, like, right, right. How does the level of, the, the degree to which an object matters to you, how is that affected by how close you are to the maker? For example, if you have objects that are one degree away from, from the maker as opposed to some sort of mass-produced object, is there a difference in how you relate to that because you yourself are a maker? Uh, the, there's definitely a, a big difference to me. I mean, I'll, I'll give you a r- real obscure one that I think you, that might be fun. Um, I, I haven't done it a lot, but I love buying hand carved wooden spoons, mm-hmm. like cooking spoons, mm-hmm. because that spoon exists because somebody picked out a piece of wood and by hand chose all the curves that exist in it. That's not just a a machine going, here's we're producing model A today. Right. Yeah, yeah. Here's a, Place here's the pattern where it fits yeah. on the piece of stock. Yeah. Yeah. But, but this, all, all the decisions that are, 
an enti- entire life's worth of experiences and decisions and personal taste got distilled into this one object that now, I now I'm using, mm-hmm. you know? Yeah. It's almost like the, the purpose or, or intent of the object and the maker of the object somehow get imbued in you. Yeah. It, Cause you know, you, you look at, say, here, we'll bring it back to the, when you look at your paintings right now, that mm-hmm. 36 set that you did, mm-hmm. your life story is baked into those. It may not be visible, but all the decisions in your life that led you to figure out how to do X, Y, Z, do that, you know, like yeah. all those things. Because if, if you painted those a year before, they'd be different. If you painted those a year from now, it would be different. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That like those paintings represent a time capsule, like a point along your journey in a way that that mass production can never really achieve. Right. You know, obviously someone had to create a plan to make that, you know, model to make that wooden spoon. Sure. But but they're not. The decision making is how, how do we make a spoon that sells a million spoons? Right, right. It's like okay, we're using we're using these pine offcuts because I could get them for thirty cents cheaper, you know. And we need to stain them this color because we want to make it look like oak. Right, you know, like all that sort of stuff, as opposed to I'm picking this piece to carve this spoon in, you know, like it's a very different sort of mentality. You know, I'm thankful that none of, you know, I had, I had a box of, I have a, you know, art portfolio box that's down in the basement, but in, it held a lot of like random stuff that I've collected over the years, but it was up on a shelf. So that didn't get, you know, I think I would have, I would have felt that far more than, than a lot of the stuff, you know, thankfully a lot of the, you know, a lot of the stuff I threw out was more the, you know, just commercial items that Mm -hmm. you want to say. Yeah. It's interesting. Your, your observations around the, the things that we make embodying the choices that came weeks, days, months, decades earlier are somehow still in there because those choices led us to that spot. That's, I think we could dive into that for a long time (laughs) (laughs) and and not, not come up for air for a while. There is something about that, that we, either intentionally or unintentionally don't realize, don't talk about, you know, that it's that, that question, you know, if you could, you know, go back and change anything in your life, you can't because you disrupt everything and you don't know what led to where you are now. Yeah. And the funny part is often some of the, my worst decisions have been the biggest moments of growth in my life right you know it's it's the weird thing where if you if i could go back in time knowing what i know now and make the choices you know obviously i would have bought a ton of apple stock but (laughs) (laughs) but the person that would come out would be unrecognizable to me and relative to who you are now yeah 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 And there is absolutely no guarantee I would like that person. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a weird notion right now in, in artificial intelligence and that sort of stuff about where they have to program imperfection into things Mm -hmm. in order to make it seem more human. If you look at like, um, you know, serving bowls, that are designed to be like ceramic. Mm-hmm. 
there often will be imperfections that are the same through every one of their set because they they want to make bake that imperfection into the bowl so it seems more handmade hmm. and the funny thing is humans have a weird almost abhorrence to perfection because we like, we know that's not real and so then, why do we keep chasing it <laughs> going with the big questions today yeah um uh, because i think there's there is beauty in the pursuit of perfection perfection itself is unattainable but the the i think human need humans need a target they need something to push forward to because it's it's like anything in life where if you don't know where you're going you're not going to end up anywhere which seems like a Instagram po slogan post from a motivator. <laughs> it, are, you, are you reading a t-shirt right now? <laughs> <laughs> but but there's there's 100% truth to that. Right. And, you know, it's funny. Uh, I forget who it was. I don't even know. I don't even remember the context of what it was about. But basically, this guy was saying that in terms of propelling you forward... A um, near miss is better than a than hitting your target in terms of driving you forward. Hmm. Because what happens is, with a near miss, you know exactly what you need to do to improve. Where if you hit your target, how do you go from there? Right. Like or or you no, don't know, but you keep yeah. you keep trying. Yeah. But. But it, with a miss, you have, uh, okay, this is what I wanted to accomplish. This is what happened. Mm -hmm. This is my theory on what changes I need to make to try to hit that target. And then you have, it's almost like the next logical steps are taken care of in a way that hitting your target never does. I think we we get hung up on sort of the negative mental health pressure that perfection sort of puts on us because there there's this weird value judgment of not hitting perfection when that is the constant state of everybody where i think perfection comes around is that it it is valuable as a guide and like a a tool to push you forward Instead of a force that judges you, if that makes sense. Yeah, I mean, it's almost like it, perfection in and of itself doesn't hold much value because, as you said, if and when you ever got there, the motivation to continue would be gone. Correct. Because all then you do is try to maintain your, your status of, of perfection. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't drive anything new right you know that's you know it to make a weird jump but if you study the rise of companies from these like little upstarts that are constantly innovated and innovating and breaking the market and sort of pushing the envelope there's a tipping point in those companies where they become more interested in maintaining their status on the top of the pile and from that point to when they declare bankruptcy, it's a slow, steady rise down. Mm -hmm. That's why you look at all the major companies that are in like the S&P 500, the one of the 500 largest stock holdings. They're, I think, 80% different companies than they were 40 years ago because those companies no longer exist. And that's, and that's a natural evolution when they're allowed to sort of die off. But that's a whole other topic. Yeah. Well, I think there's a parallel there with, with creativity where we both know people who have been trying for years, let's say, to hit, quote unquote, right? And, and create either an object or a body of work 
that resonates beyond where they were previously. And when that happens, all they do is try and recreate it to maintain that resonance and maintain that audience growth rather than trying to go, okay, well, this was a success. I've done this. Now let's break away into a different direction and do it all Mm -hmm. over again. We don't want to start all over again. We want to maintain that level of imagined success or imagined perfection. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the, a big, big one is just think of how many bands have put out an amazing first album. It's a very rare selection that have managed to put out a great first album and then continually innovate and do something new and push that envelope. Regardless of, of how that manifests in sales. Exactly. And almost almost consistently to the detriment of sales initially. Mm-hmm. You know, I remember... Um, so there was an interview with um, Frontman for Weezer. Uh, Rivers Cuomo, maybe? Yeah, yeah. Um, but he was, talk- he was talking about Pinkerton mm-hmm. and how... Pinkerton, when they released that, got shellacked and it was basically systematically canned by every critic and they didn't care. And now, now it's almost like it's become cool to, to be like, oh yeah, I'm a fan of Pinkerton. Yeah, 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 <laughs> like yeah. It's, it, you know, it's become that to them. Well, I mean, you could say the same thing about Radiohead. You could say this. I mean, there are all mm-hmm. kinds of bands who have who have kind of made that decision to not just produce another record of hits. You know, there's a there's a rant <laughs> <laughs> that I have about content <laughs> and how much I can't stand that word. And I was talking to Adrian about it the other day, and uh, I was reminded. I forget where I heard it. It might have been on a a radio station interview. It was uh, certainly it was when I was still in California, but it was an interview with with Tom York from Radiohead. And he was telling this story about how Nokia approached them about creating content for their phone operating system. You know, and, and how like so little alerts would be little <laughs> little bits of, of Radiohead jingles. Right. And just how incensed York was that what he was doing as an artist was being reduced to this sort of catch all phrase content. Mm-hmm. And I, th- I I've remembered that and thought about it ever since. And I think there there's definitely some of that almost disdain for that word because it's, it doesn't describe anything. And at the same time, it describes everything. There is no specificity to it. It's just content. What do you do? I'm a content creator. Well, what the hell does that mean? Is it, do you, do you think content is art with the soul removed? Man, I don't know. I think that's another discussion that we could dive into. Because it just, I have a real hard time with it. I have a real hard time with it. You know, it's sort of like the, I'm going to get shit for this one. It's like YouTuber. (laughs) What the hell does that mean? You know, or the YouTubers that call themselves filmmakers. Well, maybe you are, but just because you create video content does not put you in the same realm with Scorsese or Ridley Scott or, you know, Patty Jenkins and, and, and self-identifying with that moniker for producing a daily vlog. I, I don't know, man, I have a hard time with that one. Yeah. There, it's funny. There, there's some, there's some people that I followed on YouTube that I could, easily see the the title of like filmmaker 100 percent applying 100 percent. there are some absolutely brilliant folks out there and i'm not dismissing them at all but i also see where youtube itself 
because it re- rewards certain behaviors, because it's a machine that needs to get fed, it incentivizes people to produce content in the almost transactional manner that it's consumed. And I think, I think though the people that really stand out on any platform almost buck how the platform attempts to dictate the content. Like it's almost like the way you stand out on YouTube is to produce work that shouldn't be on YouTube. Right. Uh, the, the same way the photographers that sort of catch my eye on Instagram don't produce images that should be on Instagram. And the, the same way, like the reason like band like Radiohead catches people's attention is that they, they're producing music in a way that's very different, but they're on a platform of these commercially engineered projects. And it's that it's almost that weird tension between the, what the platform expects of people and those people's work that magnifies the quality of their work. Yeah, I think that's true. I mean, but at the same time, for every, for every one of those people that, that you're kind of mentioning, those type of, of artists and creators, there are 10,000 who are just posting nonsense (laughs) and I can't put them in the same category. Do you know what I mean? Like you're not David Lynch. Yeah, I, I think at that point you just sort of, okay, you want to take that title, prove it, like back it up. It, it it almost becomes one of those where like you don't need to say you're a filmmaker. We will be able to see it. Mm-hmm. You know, you're not a painter because you say you're a painter. We've seen paintings. Right. It's sort of the Austin Kleon idea of where like. Creativity is not a noun; it's a verb. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I think I think the it's sort of oh, in some sense I forget get where I heard someone talking about this, but you basically was like creative people start looking internally instead of externally for things because he's like the reason you're creative is because you're different. So why are you looking for other people's things when you have something in you? Yeah, I mean, it gets back to that Jerry Saltz quote of you have to make an enemy of envy. Yeah. Which I, I absolutely love that quote. Um, and I think there there's so much value in it because we we do. We look at other people's bodies of work. We look at their audience. We look at how much they get for their work. We get, we look at their likes, we look at their follows, all of these things. And we wonder why not me? And the short answer is there is no answer. There is no roadmap. There is no prescriptive, uh, plan that you can follow to get there regardless of what the ridiculous number of courses online that are now available that claim to have that roadmap and for 49.95 we'll teach it to you you know that you might as well just light your money on fire because there is no roadmap you just have to go inside and do the work and i think you're absolutely right and i think cleon's absolutely right on that you 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 have to look internally and you have to look at what you have to say and get that out in whatever discipline or or form that takes for you. And it may change over the course of your creative life. Yeah. Uh, Once again, another, another person's idea, but like I said, I collect them. Um, They said that artists are like prisoners in this prison of, and the prison being sort of like normal life. And, we're just trying to break out. And so we see one person break out and we're like, Oh, show me how you broke out. But of course the guards are going to block that way out. 
since they got another right, person. Right. They've, like, they've become wise to that method now. Yeah. 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 So now, you, so, but then everyone's, everyone gets so focused on how other people did it that they don't end up looking for their own way. But those are the people that we look at, right? Those are the outliers that we, well, they did it. And the exceptions mm -hmm. become in a weird way, the rule that we all want to follow. Correct. But he, but he was like, what you need to do is look at those people who made it out as confirmation that you can make it out. Mm -hmm. Subscribe to In Between in your favorite podcast app or get every episode of In Between as well as my other shows, iterations and process driven all in one feed by subscribing to Jeffrey Sidoris Everything. Earlier this month, I posted a question to my Instagram feed asking what you'd like to hear and potentially even see more of, and the responses were overwhelmingly clear. More conversations with John Wilkening and more conversations with Sean Tucker. I've spoken to both of them, and we are definitely going to make that happen, so be sure to subscribe so you don't miss any of them. You can find John on Instagram, at John Wilkening, that's J-O-N-W-I-L-K-E-N-I-N-G, or by visiting his website at johnwilkening.com. You can find Sean Tucker on Instagram as well, at Sean Tuck, that's S-E-A-N-T-U-C-K, or by visiting his website at seantucker.photography. He's got some brand new print sets available, so be sure to check them out. You can connect with me on Instagram and Twitter, at Jeffrey Sadoris, that's J-E-F-F-E-R-Y-S-A-D-D-O-R-I-S, -E -E or on my website at jeffreysadoris.com. And if you've got questions, feedback on the episode, or something you'd like for John or Sean and I to talk about, email me at talkback at jeffreysadoris.com. You can support the shows by telling a friend or by sharing them on social media. I'll be back in a week or so with another show, and I hope you'll join me. Until then, as always, thank you very much for listening. I appreciate your time, and I'll talk to you on the next one.